Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, the state is considering the idea of deregulating Arizona's electric industry. We'll hear from those for and against such deregulation. And we'll learn about a local orchestral ensemble making soothing music to ease the summer heat. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. The concept of deregulating Arizona's electric industry was considered over a decade ago, but images of Enron put a quick end to the conversation. Supporters, though, say times have changed and lessons learned. And so the Arizona Corporation Commission is again examining the issue. Joining me tonight to discuss deregulation is Chuck Coughlin of the Arizona Power Consumers Coalition, an organization opposed to deregulation. And speaking in favor of deregulation is Stan Barnes of Copper State Consultant, good to have you both here. Thanks for good joining. To be here. Thanks, Ted. Opposed to deregulation, why? Well, I think, quite frankly, we, we do a good job in Arizona. We have incumbent power providers that have done a tremendous job of delivering uh, reliable power uh, in a very harsh climate. We've had price stability. Uh, the prices that we offer here in the state are below the national average. Uh, and it's a diversity of power options that we can choose from and pricing options. You know, I, I think there, we can always do better. There's no question about that. It's just deregulating the entire industry, upending um, the way that we've done this for 100 years, which is in the Constitution of the state, uh, and suggesting there's another way to do it. What's the problem? I, I think we're, we've done a good job. If there's things we need to do better, let's do them better under the regulatory authority that we have right now. Why should we be considering deregulation? Yeah, and, and Chuck makes the, the, asks the right question. What's the problem? And the problem is consumers of Arizona are uh, held captive in a monopoly system that doesn't treat them like customers the way every other industry treats its customers. Like telephones of old, like airlines of old. Things used to be government sets the price and government tells you what you get to do then we changed that and we got great innovation in telephones and great and things like southwest airlines came along because of deregulation in those industries consumers in arizona are leaving a lot on the table other states they're getting things we don't have they have choices we don't have including the overarching choice which is the choice to not be in the monopoly that that whole dynamic of where I am as a customer versus where I could be changes the relationship there and puts a downward pressure on prices, which is important to people. Market competition, uh, many would say it's always a good thing. Why not a good thing here? And, and in, in a truly competitive, open marketplace, that's true, Ted. But what, what we're talking about here uh, is not requiring a, another company to come in and to build additional generation or build in a deregulated marketplace um, additional power lines. There's one line. I mean, there's one line that goes to your house. Uh, nobody's suggesting we're going to have to build a brand new grid. And uh, so there has to be ways to fund the reliability of that grid. W again, we live in a harsh desert environment. We have monsoons. The grid's important for delivery of power. But more importantly, I think, to the standpoint, where we have done deregulation in the electric industry across the country, it's uniformly been a disaster for consumers. I would say in Maryland, rates have increased uh, 60 percent. Pennsylvania, rates increased 53 percent. Illinois, rates increased 53 percent. Texas complaints uh, increased, uh, consumer complaints increased over 700 percent. In Texas right now, they're looking at increasing rates for everybody because they've kept rates so low that the, the market is not set to, to create additional generation capacity. I would say in the coming months, we may be looking at Texas having some brownouts because everybody knows it's not, you can't just go out and say, I'm going to go build a new power plant today. Um, particularly, and that's an important point for Arizona too. There's, we've always lived in Arizona on a diverse set of power supplies from nuclear to coal uh, to solar uh, to natural gas. Um, and it's always demonstrated that the, the m best market for consumers is where you have a number of choices to choose from in that market. 
in this market, I don't think anybody would ever make an investment in a coal-fired power plant right now. Nobody would make an investment in additional nuclear capacity because there's no way that a capital market will say, oh, that's a great, great idea. I don't know who's going to service me, but let me go put $2.5 billion on the table to build new, yeah, new is this a different? Is it a different beast we're dealing with here in no, Arizona? No, it's not a different beast, but, but it's, it's worthy of pointing out that the disappointment in this debate is that the utilities, which normally stand on fact and legal analysis in the confines of the Corporation Commission, have decided that they don't have the facts on their side, and so they've mounted a large political campaign outside of 1200 West Washington where the decisions are made. It's, I've talked to a lawyer who's been down there for four decades and never seen a utility play the populist role outside of the facts on the inside of the building where that that decisions taking place the fear campaign by the other side is unfortunate because it it is it works on people who otherwise don't know how electricity is made but to get right to your point no electricity is not a special animal that has to be treated differently in a monopoly. But if with the 60 percent increase in Maryland, 55 in Illinois, 53 in Pennsylvania, right. with the Corporation Commission supposed to be watching out for you, me, and Joe and Mary down the street, right. how do you explain that? The, well, I, I have explanations for those complex Democratic-led states that had artificial rate caps that stood for five years, and when they re removed the rate cap, rates went to market and they went up. That did happen. But that wasn't because of retail competition. That was because of how those rate makers designed the market. In Arizona, we're not going to make the mistake California made. We're not going to make the mistakes they made in, in New Jersey. But there are things we can do to bring competitive pressures to customers. That's what we're talking about. Well, I, I just fundamentally, we, we've got a system in place. I, I like the idea of, of regulating the utility with state level regulation. Because um, what we're really talking about here is not a fully deregulated marketplace. That's a misnomer. When you go into the, when you, when you begin to advocate, as, my, as Stan does, to move away from a state-regulated system, you fall under the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. So you get re-regulated by those entities under what they call an RTO a, uh, or an ISO, an independent system operator. And so what you're really doing is advocating state control for some federal regulatory control and you're asking those guys to control the market and to say that's going to be a competitive market under that system and I just don't find the merit in that the facts don't support it I, I, I you know I'm, I'm disappointed to see that Stan says we're moving you know this big powerful it's not hard to make these arguments because we have a hundred year history here in Arizona of companies that are largely responsible for building the state that we're in right now we have this competitive system can we I'm I would agree with Stan, we can do better, but do we need to upend the entire structure to create a better answer? I would say no. Fifteen years ago when we did this the first time, we passed a bill in the legislature, it's still the law today, that says competition is our policy, which is a good thing. The leaders of Arizona Public Service and Tucson Electric Power and Salt River Project stood up and said, we want to give the benefits of competition to our constituencies. Fifteen years later, nothing's changed, except the utilities have, have decided they can stop this before we even get to talk about it. And this is an important point for your viewers. A very sophisticated audience who watches Horizon, right? Sure. We're not going to flip a switch in September or October at the, over at the Corporation Commission and move to competition. What, we're, what I'm hoping they're going to do is vote to step into the rulemaking exercise, which will take some time, and everyone will be at the table. And if it's no good, they'll vote it and, down. And, and my, my concern about that is, Two of the entities we have in this state are publicly traded companies. We already know that there's an enormous amount of pressure on the Salt River Project and CAP and other institutions on the, on the Navajo Generating Station. Um, APS has already announced that they've suspended further capital investments in their Four Corners plant because of the instability this debate causes in those markets. It's, it, I, as a businessman, am not going to go invest tons of money in capital infrastructure if the rate if if the way it's going to be regulated is going to be upended entirely and so what i would what i would suggest is i would hope that the commission does its job put this issue to bed pr quietly and then work with stan's organizations work with um people who want to see um more competitive rates which want to see 
you know, the price of peak power, you know, maybe we overuse peak power. Maybe there's a way to reduce the demand on peak power that we're not asking our incumbent utilities to. But that's what our Corporation Commission is for. That's what our forefathers saw as the sensible way to do it. I don't think that's changed. Very quickly, the idea of these other states going this direction and whether they release the caps or whatever happened and the, and the rates increased, regardless of what happened, some would argue that's the true price of energy and the market made the price and we have to deal with the market. That is what market competition is yeah. all about. How, how do you respond to that? Well, I've, I've heard the Adam Smith, the invisible hand of there the free go. market to say that, and I just don't believe it's ever existed in, in, in electric utility uh, rate settings because as we see in the last couple of weeks, we've seen J.P. Morgan Chase has paid a $430 million fine for manipulating energy markets. Uh, Barclays paid a fine. Uh, you, you saw a, pay, a story on the front page of the Wall Street Journal the other day about how Goldman Sachs is, is hoarding aluminum in factories to artificially manipulate the price of a commodity. That's what happens in a deregulated marketplace, and I fear that if we disempower our state and take ourselves, take the responsibility away from our Arizona Corporation Commissions, who we elect, that's a mistake. I, we're not doing that. The sky is not going to fall if customers have a choice. The government doesn't set the price of gasoline, doesn't set the price of food, doesn't set the price of housing, no longer sets the price of an airline ticket, has no role to play in setting the price of an electron generated. Now, the delivery of the electron, the wires, the transmission, the meter, the billing, you name it, they're still going to regulate that. We're only talking about the generation. Ted, an important point. If you're in Houston and you buy a house, you don't plug in and pay your bill at the end of the month and hope you have enough money. There are what I call a thousand flowers blooming in Texas. You might have a plan because you have a lot of people chasing you that is 100% renewable energy. And you can do it with the click of a mouse, not with a rooftop thing on your, on your roof. And there are a, a dozens of other choices that we don't have in Arizona. Fifteen years ago, wind, solar, fuel cells, all these arguments were way, way out there in the future. Well, we're, we're there now, and they're changing the landscape. Are they changing the landscape enough to say, maybe we look at deregulation? I don't think so, because I think we can look at all those alternative sources under the current regulatory structure we have. There's no reason why we cannot. Um, what I, what I, my concern here is in this, de, in a deregulated, Stan just said, divest um, of our generating capacity. Well, then who owns that generating capacity? And, you know, my experience is in deregulation, fewer and fewer entity, entities own that. There's fewer airlines today, prices have gone up. There's fewer banks today, fees have gone up. I'm not, I'm not naive enough to believe that there's not a lot of financial institutions out there that would look at the Arizona marketplace and say, maybe if I buy 30% of the generating capacity there, maybe I can control the market. Because again, it's not easy to build a new power plant. It's not like something you come in with the reg, you know, you gotta get local zoning, you gotta get state approvals, you gotta get federal approvals, you gotta get eight DAQ approvals. We it got, just doesn't happen. We've got about 30 seconds left. Last word, we're gonna go all the way back to the beginning. Things seem to be humming along pretty well right now. Why change? Yeah, because there's, were there, we're leaving a lot on the table. Things could be a lot better. Competitive pricing and a flurry of options that come to you. One thing we haven't touched on, companies that have a big power bill might like to control their energy costs so they can expand and have certainty. That's another big indicator. Well, some are arguing that that's who's behind the push. Are these well, yeah, there's no, there's no secret about that. These companies, large employers in Arizona, want control of their energy. Why not? And I don't know why we couldn't do that under this existing structure. I don't know why you have to throw the baby out with the bathwater. We'll stop it right there. Great discussion. Good to have you both here. Thanks for Thanks joining us. Thanks for the opportunity.
Along an isolated stretch of State Route 80, deep in southeast Arizona, is a monument to one of the most important events in Arizona history. Off the highway is Skeleton Canyon, where the Apache warrior Geronimo, Naichi, son of Cochise, and their followers surrendered to General Nelson Miles. It was early September, 1886. With the surrender, armed conflict between the Apaches and European immigrants ended. Geronimo, his followers, and the entire Chiricahua tribe, even the Apache scouts the army had hired to track him down, were deported east to Florida. Geronimo lived until 1909, gaining notoriety at public appearances and in Teddy Roosevelt's inaugural parade. Yet he and his people were never allowed to return to their beloved Arizona homeland. Only in 1986 did the governor and state officially welcome back the Chiricahua tribe to Arizona after 100 years of exile. In tonight's edition of Arizona Art Beat, uh, we'll look at a local orchestra that performs cooling music to ease the summer heat. What started as the Scottsdale Baroque Orchestra is now a chamber orchestra called Arizona Pro Art. The group is currently experimenting with performances to see if Valley residents want classical music in the summer. So far, the response has been positive. Reporter Laurie Allen and photographer Scott Olson and Steve Snow attended a recent concert and discovered that not only is Arizona Pro Art unique, some of the group's members are too. Word is getting out about the Valley's Chamber Orchestra, Arizona Pro Art. Its most recent concert attracted a full house. By night, these musicians are rock stars. Well, make that orchestra stars. But by day, most support themselves with another job. Sure, some play in a band and others teach music. Then there's this guy. Ain't no sunshine when she's gone. And she's always gone too long Anytime she goes away He's Robert Lee. He's been playing the French horn since he was eight. By day, he's in information security. You know, I, I worked as a penetration tester for a number of years and even had my own penetration testing company. And if you're not familiar with what that term means, essentially I got paid to break into companies. Uh, all legal, of course. I, I got paid by the company that I was breaking into, but we were testing how good their security was. So in, in that part, uh, you know, the, the patterns, the logic, the, uh, the mathematical part of music definitely translated. And, you know, if I'm thinking of a difficult problem, I can go play music for a little bit and by the end of a session maybe come up with the solution that I, I was struggling with. And so when you think about a typical day in the life for you three years from now, what would it look like? Debbie Exner is a coach and a speaker. Except when she's playing the bass. That's right, the big instrument. At the time in high school, I think it was, it, it was exciting that it was such a large instrument and that I could carry it. And it's, that appeal's gone now. The most commonly asked question is, don't you wish you played the flute? I like the really low sounds. I think it's Gary Carr that talked about it sounding like chocolate. And I just really love that warm, rich sound. And, and the role that the bass plays in any, you know, first of all, it's a very versatile instrument. It's used in lots of different kinds of music. And the role that it plays in the orchestra kind of is the foundation. So I just enjoy that process and that, that role very much. Okay. Speaking can be a lonely job, so Exner appreciates the collaboration of Arizona Pro Art. Playing with an orchestra is just a magical experience. You're a piece of this huge tapestry of sound, and it's really fantastic to see it all come together. Exner says being a musician makes her better in the workplace. You're, you're listening to what's going on in the orchestra, you're watching the conductor, you're looking at the music and what's on the printed page, and you are adapting and adjusting as you go along. And I think those skills are really helpful as a speaker to read the audience and see where things are going. And as a coach, to hear the changes in someone's vocal inflection or 
the way they're breathing or to get, you know, sense cues about how they're sitting with whatever it is that you're talking about at that time. So I think it does help. It sharpens your senses and helps you to use all your senses so that you can do a more effective job. The conductor says the unusual professions found in his orchestra can be an advantage. It gives them different background experiences because we find in music, even through composers like Charles Ives, who was an insurance agent, and Alexander Bordin, who was a chemist, they were still able to produce wonderful music and just amazing works while still having a different day job. So really, I, I don't think in terms of better or not better, it really applies here. I think it just gives them a different background and a different approach from where they're coming from. And different defines not only the musician's day jobs, but Arizona Pro Art itself. Uh, some of the other things we do are, are collaborations with silent films. We work with different uh, artists that are singers or actors. All throughout the season, we have a large variety of what we do, but at our core, we still have really great musical ensemble that everything is built around. We have a reach that's just even beyond the valley. We have an international call for scores where composers from around the world enter our competition. We received one today from Brazil and another one from Japan. So we're not only just making an impact here, we're making an impact globally. Arizona Pro Art has one more concert in its Summer Cool Classics series. It's set for August 24th and features works by Haydn and Schubert. For more information, go to the website azproart.org. Friday on Arizona Horizon, it's the Journalists' Roundtable. President Obama visits Phoenix to talk about home ownership in the middle class, and House Speaker Andy Tobin leads the fight over benefits for the families of the fallen Yarnell Hill firefighters. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening.